Greetings, I'm the Bulgarian Trocrodite. Today I'm gonna talk about my favorite books in my book collection. So these are basically most of my favorite books of all time, but there are some that I have read as like ebooks that I don't own, but are still my favorites. One example is George Orwell's 1984. I really like that book, but I read it through Kindle and I don't have a physical copy of it yet, but I want to get one at some point. But anyway, I don't have that many books here. As you guys know, I really like reading books, but I actually haven't read that many books during my life in the end, as I sometimes have some concentration issues due to many forms of anxiety that I have. So I don't have a very consistent reading schedule, unfortunately. I, re I really admire those people who can read every day. I mean, sometimes I have those moods when I'm constantly reading, but then I have longer periods when I'm not reading at all. But maybe someday I can fix it and become more of a consistent reader. But currently I'm in a reading mood, so that's great. Yeah. But anyway, let's get through these books. I'll talk about each one a little bit, but I'll try to go through them fairly quickly. And also as I'm quite young and as I have so many blind spots when it comes to literature, I'm not much of a re-reader yet, although I want to read this again in the future of course, but currently when I read, I want to read something that I haven't read before because I have so many blind spots and there are so many books on my shelf that I haven't read yet. So. Yeah, but anyway, we're gonna start with a couple of my absolute favorites and the first one I'm actually gonna show is probably my favorite book of all time and it's Against Nature by Yori Karl Huismans and I also have another book from him called The Damned which is also absolutely amazing. I think both of these are on my top 10 of all time. These were both written in the late 19th century so they are like Finn the Seagull novels, I probably mispronounced that term, but that refers to the kind of end of 19th century and the kind of period when the 19th century was about to shift, uh, shift to the 20th century. Yeah. But these are absolutely amazing. The prose in both of these is absolutely beautiful. I started with Against Nature and as I absolutely loved it, I very soon after got the damned and then read it pretty much immediately and loved it too. But Against Nature is about this aristocrat who buys a villa and he moves there and then he just spends time alone thinking about all kind of luxurious and aesthetic things about art and aesthetics and things like that. And we see his inner world in this book and what he thinks about art and society and he's a very snobbish person he thinks that he's very unique and smart so i can actually kind of in a weird way <laughs> relate to this book because i have many of the same kind of cultural criticisms or the same style of cultural criticism that this main character has i don't think i'm as much of an asshole as he is but i guess maybe i am <laughs> but I, I just love his character so much and this is just so funny and the prose here is absolutely beautiful and i was like smiling and laughing throughout the whole book just because the style is so amazing and how he makes these snobby comments like he says that yeah goya's paintings are so amazing but now that they are so popular i cannot like them anymore like, yeah it's just such a great book and this is of course a classic but it's more of a I could say, you could say maybe a cult classic that it's not obviously as famous as Jane Austen or Shakespeare or Dostoevsky or even Flaubert and Balzac and many of those other great French guys. But this is to me like just absolutely incredible and the use of language here is just so masterful that you can read this just because of the beautiful style. Yeah. I would highly recommend this to everybody, especially if you feel alienated when you come across mass culture and things like that. And if you feel that 
the world is very anti-intellectual. I think this is something that would give your soul some needed energy and refreshment. I could say, yeah, I don't know. But anyway, absolutely amazing. Then the damned, yeah. Maybe I'll read the back actually because I think they sum it up really well here. So Durdal, a shy, censorious man, is writing a biography of Gilles de Rice, the monstrous 15th century child murderer, thought to be the original for Bluebeard, bored and disgusted by the vulgarity of everyday life. So that's like me. Durdal seeks spiritual solace by immersing himself in another age. But when he starts asking questions about Gilles, involvement in sa satanic rituals and is introduced to the exquisitely evil Madame Chanteloup. He is soon thrown into a twilight world of black magic and erotic devilry in Fin de Siegel, Paris. Published in 1891, The Damned, who is Huisman's reputation as a writer at the forefront of the avant-garde and as one of the challenging and innovative figures in European literature. Yeah, I look at this fucking cover so darkly beautiful and insane and I remember when I read this like I started laughing on the first page because I just loved the prose so much and I got such an intellectual high from reading it so the same thing happened with this as it happened with Against Nature and based on these Huismans, two Huismans novels he's one of my favorite writers and I'm very excited to read more of his stuff but these are the two that are his most famous works, I think. But this book, like you heard from the synopsis, is a very dark book, lots of dark topics here, but I think it has also lots of dark humor, just like Against Nature, so it's actually a very entertaining read, and you don't need to be in the mood for dark stuff to read this, because it's funny and very readable, and not just dark. But yeah, who is Mans? I wish that he was like studied in all of the literature departments in, in the universities because he's just so good and I think his prose is might be it might be even better than Flaubert's, even though I'm a huge Flaubert fan and we'll get to him in a bit, but his prose is just the best I've ever read and I don't know how somebody can write that well, like it's just absolutely insane and I cannot wait to reread both of those books, but especially Against Nature. And I'm actually currently reading Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray, which is obviously one of the most famous classics. And Oscar Wilde actually took inspiration from Against Nature. And while I really like uh, The Picture of Dorian Gray so far, but I think Against Nature is better. And then we have some Dostoevsky. So we have Crime and Punishment in this Penguin Glotbout edition. This was a book that I really devoured in a week, even though it's a very long book, because I got hooked into it like very quickly. And you probably know, know the story of this book. It's obviously one of the most famous Russian novels. I absolutely love Dostoevsky's style and kind of his world building, how he, through his dark and kind of, you could say even disgusting, language he is able to really create the atmosphere of that time in Russia and how dark the how dark Russia was back then and he really knows how to describe poverty and things like that and I really just love his style of writing. It's obviously not as flowery as Tolstoy and many other writers of this time, but I like that it's a bit rougher because it fits the stories really well. And this book is obviously about morality, like can a person be moral when he's an atheist? Do you need to believe in something greater than yourself to be moral? And then also how human psyche reacts when you do some heinous acts, like there is of course this horrible violence here that Raskolnikov commits and we can explore what he feels after he has done that and what happens to him after that and that violence happens very early on in the book or it may be 
50, 60 or 70 pages in if I remember correctly and yeah and then there's this character I think her name is Sonia that kind of is someone who's important to Raskolnikov and she kind of helps to helps him to deal with some of his emotions and views but it's a very entertaining book but also a very deep book and again the comments that I just said about the book are just scratching the surface there's so much more to it that and I'm sure much of it went over my head as I'm not much of a I'm not very good at analyzing books yet as I feel like I haven't read enough because that's obviously a skill that you develop the more you read yeah but this is such a great book and very addicting book it's easy to kind of get lost in the story then we have this penguin classic edition of Dostoevsky's notes from underground and the double and notes from underground is absolutely incredible it's a shorter work but as good as crime and punishment and that's a good example of his style again how he is able to build this disgusting dark Russian world filled with this kind of um, again dark imagery of like how people live in poverty and alienation and things like that but the book is also quite funny at places in a dark way and okay the prose is incredible and it's one of those books where I feel like that you could really just stop at every sentence and every paragraph and analyze it for a long time because there's just so much substance in every single line of this work and absolutely love it and then the double is actually the first Dostoevsky I ever read in high school when I had a kind of literature history course and in that course we had to choose like two classics that we would write essays on so I chose Dostoevsky's the double although my reason to, to choose that then was because it was fairly short and then uh, Hemingway's the old man the old man and the sea which I actually didn't really like at, at least back then but maybe I would like it now so I read those two for the course but the double I actually enjoyed even back then it's about a guy who starts seeing a, another guy who looks exactly like him and then he gets all paranoid and then there's this question in this book whether it's just this imagination or whether he actually has a double so it's a great kind of psychological thriller you could say but yeah incredible incredible stuff and then earlier this year of course we talked about this a bit in the podcast but I read Dostoevsky's White Knights so this is a small short story collection and it has White Knights I haven't read the other two here yet but White Knights is absolutely incredible maybe his most emotional work out of the ones that I have read it's a, such a sh- sad story of a man who falls in love with a woman but the woman is still in love with another man even though he hasn't been there in a while and then again the guy returns and then the our main character um, is left to solitude basically and to sadness and yeah it's a very heartbreaking novel but such a beautiful one at the same time yeah yeah so those are the Dostoevskys then I have this kind of a hardback Kafka collection so this has lots of the famous short stories like the metamorphosis in the penal colony and lots of like very short stuff I think I've read most of these if not all of them but these are really good I love Kafka of course we often think of him as like a very serious writer but I think there's always the story that when Kafka was reading his stories to some of his friends they were all laughing so there's actually lots of kind of weird humor in Kafka's works and I think I can at times notice it but I'm not like laughing out loud when I'm reading Kafka and my favorite Kafka is the trial which actually I have somewhere here yeah we have have it here in this penguin modern classics but I also love these short stories and I just love his way how he describes the environment and everything that just seems like a threat 
and that's so, so, so relatable for someone who has anxiety and I think I really relate to the character of Kay here because of course he his story is that basically everything around him is fighting against him and I can sometimes feel that in the world too so I think Kafka Kafka's stories his writing is very relatable to me yeah I love Kafka haven't read in him, him in a while and I really need to read the castle haven't read that one yet so then we have Flaubert, and after Flaubert we actually have one of Flaubert's friends. But we have um, Madame Bovary in this gorgeous cloth bound edition, and this is one of my absolute favorites. In my top five, along with again the Huisman's stuff and probably Crime and Punishment and Notes from Underground. I know that many people think that Flaubert is boring, which is just so hard for me to imagine how, how you can feel like that when you read Flaubert. Of course in Madame Bovary there isn't that much happening. The story is fairly simple on the surface. Again it's about this doctor and he marries Emma and then Emma uh, cheats on him with two men and she's a character who never feels happiness. She always is thinking about that she needs something more, she needs something more luxurious and that's obviously a big part of the human condition that we always want something more even if our life is good, even if we have great people around us, even if we have roofs over our heads and food on the table and hobbies and stuff but we always just think that but what about those rich people or what about those knights in the stories or what about those heroes or whatever we always want something more something we cannot have so it's a very deep work about very essential things in the human condition and Flaubert was a kind of perfectionist writer his prose is absolutely amazing every single sentence feels like it's been perfectly thought out and I absolutely love the style and and again to me even if book is very slow if it's beautifully written, if the prose is very beautiful, it doesn't get boring to me. And that's the case with Madame Bovary. It's a fairly slow book. There aren't that many huge events in it, although there are some. But just because the writing is so beautiful, I'm always engaged in this work. And yeah, I absolutely love this. Absolutely love this. And I think uh, many, uh, many of us, if not all of us, can relate to many of these themes. Yeah. Because I'm sure that all of us, of course, at least sometimes feel unhappy. And if you have felt unhappy, if you feel unhappy, you should be able to relate to many of the things in this book. Yeah. And then another Flaubert book, which is probably his second most famous one after Madame Bovary's Sentimental Education. Which is about this love story. We have a law student who is in love with an older a woman. So kind of a classic tale in that way. But again, amazing story, not that much happens. It's fairly slow paced, I guess, for at least for many readers, but I was really engaged with the story the whole way through. And again, the prose here is absolutely beautiful and perfect. Yeah. And I love kind of unconventional love stories. I love to see like stories where a character is like obsessively in love with another person. I enjoy that type of story a lot. And Flaubert is a perfect writer for that. And obviously France is a perfect country for a story like that. Yeah. And I guess sentimental education might actually be maybe a better place to start for some people. I started with Madame Bovary, but I think sentimental education maybe in terms of the plot just the pacing it might be a bit easier to get into for people who get easily bored with literature I guess I would say that maybe but but I, I would say that I prefer Madame Bovary a little bit as I said it's probably in my top five books of all time but sentimental education is pretty much as good and then like I said we have Flaubert's friend Ivan Turgenev so we have his most famous novel Fathers and Sons, which is absolutely amazing. 
And this is kind of the work where the term nihilism comes from, or at least this is kind of a, the place where it was more well thought out, the idea of nihilism. And I remember even at university, in our like contemporary political thought course, the first uh, lecture was about like 19th century, and then the other lectures were about 20th century thinkers, but in the introductory lecture, Turgenev was mentioned because of course nihilism is very important for philosophy and political thought since the term came to be. But this is basically that kind of classic tale of generational differences. So we have these young guys, okay, one of them is a hardcore nihilist, and then he gets in contact with his friends father and father's friend I think and then they start seeing how differently they think about the world, about nature, about art and then it's very interesting to see their conversation and how their ideas differ from each other and obviously this is a Russian classic from the 19th century so it might seem intimidating at first but this is actually a very readable book I think the prose is very beautiful but also just like it's very easy to get into and I was really hooked in this story from the start and I really loved reading the whole book and it was very entertaining but also intellectually stimulating and it reminded me a bit of like Ozu in film because those films are of course all about generational differences and about the changing world and so if you like Ozu and if you like those kind of generational differences types of stories this one would be for you, and if you like philosophical novels, this would be for you. Yeah, definitely also in my top 10, I would say. Then another 19th century writer, I think the character in Who is Man so Against Nature actually hate this, hated this author, uh, Valid Sonor de Balzac and Pierre Corriot, the only book from him that I've read so far, and I don't even own any of his other works yet, but I'm planning to get more in either the Oxford Verse Classics or Penguin Classics. But this is a great book and Balzac is known for kind of exploring class and I think working class and also like middle class Paris and things like that. But here we have a father who really loves his daughters. There are two of the daughters and he does everything for the daughters but the daughters always keep asking more so we see that kind of decaden decadence in the 19th century Paris we see how people are greedy and selfish and how love is not enough for people but they are all about money instead of love and it's about this again tragic character who is a very well-meaning character but gets screwed in the end and that actually kind of relates to Madame Bovary as again the physician, the male character who is married to Emma and Emma cheats on him even though he is actually like a really great, decent man. So we, in both of these novels we kind of see a good character getting screwed over by other people. Yeah. But this is like very essential 19th century French stuff. Okay, they're kind of realism of that era. It, not might, it might not be exciting for people who love stories about heroes and things like that, but it's really good in my opinion and it again touches on very important things about the human condition that we still struggle with today, almost 200 years later after this was published, so yeah. But great stuff, great stuff. Then something completely different, although this is actually situated in Paris as well, but it's Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin, a famous African-American writer. This is the only one of his that I have read so far, but I have another one of his ready to be read on my shelf, another country, which my friend Tony uh, got me for my birthday this year, so thanks to him again. So this is an amazing novel. So it's a very daring book because this was obviously written in like the mid 20th century 
Baldwin and African American writing about writing about like white gay men. So obviously that's like very daring during that time. It's not as daring anymore, but obviously at that time. And Baldwin has a beautiful way of writing. It's very raw, full of emotion, especially again the raw type of emotion. And it's a very emotional book. And we see how these characters are kind of trapped in their lives and how they have these emotional wars and emotional problems and how they feel about love and sex and relationships and stuff. And okay, the main character also, we see his relationship with his father and there's lots of package there as well. So, so yeah, it's a good, amazing, really amazing uh, book. Very emotional one, yeah. We thought to rereading this at some point, yeah. Then this next one, I don't have much to say about this one, but this one, this is just pure fun to me. So it's Charles Bukowski's Post Office. Again, it's about his kind of alter ego, and he's a post office worker, and he goes to the racetrack and drinks a lot, and and yeah, he's such a loser, but in a in a fun way. There's not much to say about it. Bukowski stuff is just fun to read. Then we have a Finnish novel, actually. This is something that's mandatory to read in high school, although I don't know whether it's still the case, as it has been a, um, almost a decade since I graduated. So, But this is Sinu He by Mika Valtari, or The Egyptian in English. And this has been translated into many languages, like I think German, English, Spanish, Swedish, French maybe, and maybe some other languages as well. But so I had to write an essay about this in school and I was kind of very intimidated to read it but then I somehow really got into the story. So we see Sinuhei's kind of whole story. It actually starts when he's older and we see how bitter he is when he's older but then we kind of go back in time to his childhood and then we see his whole journey. Again, his father is, I think, a physician. Then he also grows to be a physician. But then he learns a lot, lot, lots of things about his actual heritage and things like that. And he has these big adventures and he has these quite um, toxic relationships with some woman. And then when he finds a nice woman, it doesn't go that well. But yeah, it's a very epic story set in ancient Egypt. Yeah, so it's a great historical fiction epic story. So if you like that type of stuff, I think you would like that one. Then I actually lost my Shakespeare virginity in the past week or so. I read a couple of his plays. So I have the Oxford complete Shakespeare, so I read Macbeth first and then I read Romeo and Juliet and next I'm probably gonna read Hamlet and King Lear because obviously those are some of the big ones but I absolutely loved both Romeo and Juliet and Macbeth I would say maybe Macbeth I slightly prefer but I gave both of them like a five star rating and I of course knew both of the stories and what they were about but I'm so glad that I finally read Shakespeare. I felt this huge shame that I hadn't read him because he's obviously up there with like the Holy Bible as like some of the most important stuff that you just need to read if you want to understand literature at all. So, and I'm really glad that I get the hype because obviously there are people who don't like Shakespeare, but although I think for many people it's because they are forced to read him in like high school and then they maybe have a bad teacher or those clashes are annoying and then they kind of have this bitterness towards Shakespeare their whole lives even though maybe they would like him in their 20s if, if they tried it again. But in Finland I had a, I didn't have to read Shakespeare in school. We watched the Leonardo DiCaprio, Romeo and Juliet film which was fun. And again, I've seen some of the adaptations for these things and of course heard many people talk about them. 
but it's of course very different to read it and hopefully someday I will be able to see like a theater productions of them that would be cool and they do them in Finland too but I think it won't be the same in the Finnish language because Shakespeare is one of those authors that you kind of have to read in the original I think because he has such a beautiful style and such a particular style that it's probably very difficult to translate that into other languages although I've now that I've been kind of uh, reading about Shakespeare a bit after I read those I've heard that apparently that some of the German translations are actually really, really good but I don't know how it is for many other languages but of course as those plays are like 400 years old it was there were some like words here and there that I didn't know and and I think I'm probably now that I'm just getting into his stuff I'm probably missing some things due to the Middle English although I think from what I hear Shakespeare is one of the maybe easier easier ones of easier writers of that era to read and there are other Middle English writers that are a bit more difficult yeah but I really enjoyed them. I don't have that much any interesting things to say about them because I'm sure that you know them already. You might have studied them in school and yeah. But of course they still have very relevant themes for our current time. And just like many people say Shakespeare is kind of like everything in one person and it feels like he has such a deep understanding of what it means to be a human that he kind of tackled every single thing in his in his works yeah and I just love the style alone it's kind of worth reading for the style alone but then when you start unpacking the stories and the themes there is a lot to chew on there and I think the character of Macbeth for example still feels quite relevant today how again getting into power corrupts you because of course in the beginning Macbeth hears from those three witches that yeah you are gonna be the king and then when he becomes the king he murders people like again the, the Duncan first and then other people and then we're gonna see what happens when a person gets into power and that's very relevant still to this day maybe more than ever so yeah but anyway I'm excited to read Hamlet and King Lear yeah and Hamlet, even though it's very famous, it's actually probably the uh, one out of the most famous ones that I know the least about. So I'm very excited to get into that. And then after Hamlet and King Lear, I of course want to read other stuff like Julius Caesar. Sounds really interesting and all that. Pretty much everything sounds interesting, but I know that obviously not all of them are going to be masterpieces, but many of them will be. And then final thing is, again, I have this essay collection, although I've of course kind of thinking whether I should have it here because I actually haven't read all of these essays but the ones that I have read are just absolutely amazing so I thought that I would have it here so it's Emma Goldman's Anarchism and other essays again she was like one of the main anarchist thinkers of the first half of the 20th century she was a very tough woman a very you could say eccentric a woman she had a she was such a tough writer she went against things very harshly so my, maybe some people might think that she's kind of an asshole when they re read her but I absolutely love her stuff and I agree with much of what what she says not of course of course not like everything she says but much of it and she's kind of becoming one of my intellectual heroes so I really really love her there's for example this essay called majorities and minorities that goes quite in depth about kind of anti-intellectualism and the decadence of mass culture and stuff like that and I absolutely love that essay yeah but anyway those were some of my favorite books but like I said there are some books that I really love that I don't own and also in my shelves there are many books that I like but that aren't like all-time favorites like Again, there are books like Pride and Prejudice and Mrs. Dalloway that I really like, but I don't at least now consider them to be like absolutely my all-time favorites. Yeah. 
But anyway, thanks for watching. Let me know your favorite books and let me know what you think of these books or any of these authors and their other works. Yeah, sayonara and arigato gozaimasta.